Let's look at some differences between original swords and replica swords that makers don't want you to know. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Guy Troy. Now first up, apologies for that rather clickbaity title and entrance. Um, and uh, by all means, I don't think that makers are necessarily intending to deceive, okay? But let's set out a basic fact here. Modern replica swords are made for modern people with different uh, needs, a different context of use. Uh, compared to the original medieval swords which were made as weapons to be used in war or duels or whatever. And what we're really talking about here actually are two different subsets. There is um, catering your manufacturing of replicas to the modern market's needs and then there's making true replicas. But what I'm going to look at this video is some of the common differences that we find between original period swords from anywhere in the world and replica swords. But before we get into the real nitty gritty of this video and examine the details of the big differences between replica and period swords, we're going to have a word from our sponsors who very kindly to this video are Mecharena. Mecharena is the tactical 5 versus 5 robot fighting game. It really captures the magic of PC and console based shooter games. One of the great things about Mech Arena is you can really express yourself in tactics but also in your mechs and how you choose them, which mechs you choose, what weapons you choose and what skins you put on them. So one of my absolute favourite mechs here is Panther. Not just a cool name but also a cool looking mech and uh, you've got a bunch of different skins that you can earn or um, kind of win essentially. I'm also a big fan of Lancer here and you can see that Lancer has a bunch of cool skins, that's pretty much the standard one. I love this leopard print one, super cool. Green, good for camo, um, and a bunch of others that you can get as you go further through the game. Let's change the skin on my Paragon here. Go up to skins and Oh, funky Hawaiian shirt. So by competing you can win fortune keys which you can then go into the fortune vault and you can open up a crate which will randomly assign you a reward. Awesome, so I just got the new Jungle Leopard skin. On my Panther mech I have chosen weapon 1, a uh, thermal lance and then weapon 2, the pulse cannon which gives me good variety, range and just general kick-assness. Mech Arena has awesome in-game events as well as great login rewards program which you definitely don't want to miss out on. Mech Arena is completely free to download, free to play and you can play it on Android or iOS. You can use the link in my description below this video or the QR code on screen. And if you do that you'll get one black carbon skin, 300 A coins, 50,000 credits to help kickstart your game. And if you're quick, you can add me to your friends. I go under the name Context. And maybe we can play some games together, so don't hang around, go download and give it a go now. So thanks for sticking with me. Now let's get back to the meat of this video, which is the difference between uh, replica swords and period swords. And as I say, I'm not going to talk about the differences in materials or construction methods particularly. I'm going to talk more about the end result, okay? So the differences that we commonly find between period swords and modern replica swords. Now, I should point out one thing. So modern replica swords, you could roughly split them into two types. Okay, there are swords which are a exact replica of a period example. Okay, so it could be a replica of an example in a museum or a private collection. It could have been a sword owned by a famous person. And in some cases, a maker or a company will make an exact replica of that sword. Okay, so we're not talking about those because they are true replicas in, hopefully, anyway, assuming that they're true to the uh, original statistics. They are true replicas in terms of, you know, their length, their weight, their balance, their distal taper, the length of the grip, all of these kind of things. And these are things we're going to look at in this video. Um, but there is a much, much bigger subset of replica swords that aren't precise replicas of a specific single example and they are rather analogs okay so a lot of swords and I'm not gonna um, pick on any particular companies here and if I hold up swords that are made by specific companies like um, an Albion for example I'm not particularly picking on Albion because really this goes for loads and loads I mean you know 90% of sword companies making replica swords they make something which is an analog and is based on a bunch of original swords and may be more or less representative of those period swords. And we're going to talk really about how the divergence, where the biggest points of divergence are between the modern replica swords and the period ones. So the first thing that I want to focus on is that modern swords catering to the modern consumer and what the modern consumer likes 
they tend to be less diverse in terms of weight or mass if you prefer. Okay, so I put this sword down for a second and just grab a different one for variety. So quite simply, if we look at medieval arming swords, and we could be talking about any swords here, as I say, from anywhere in the world in any period of history, but if we look at medieval arming swords, the actual period examples are very diverse in mass. They can vary from, uh, you know, say about six or 700 grams all the way up to about 1400 grams. A huge, great variety. Now, admittedly, there are some heavy modern replicas, whether it's an arming sword, a long sword, or a Chinese uh, jian, or a Japanese katana, or whatever. S generally speaking, in the modern world, the modern consumer now takes it to mean that if an arming sword, for example, is 1400 grams, it is too heavy and it is therefore a bad replica. But we have to really emphasize that comparing to period swords, this isn't necessarily true. You can get some very, very good swords that happen to be heavier. You can get some very, very good swords which happen to be lighter. So in the modern world, the consumer often associates lightweight with good quality, heavier weights with poorer quality, and that is often true. Uh, but in the period, when we're talking about period swords, bear in mind that a sword like an arming sword, just using this as a single example, has an enormous weight range. Now, if we look at good quality manufacturers of modern arming swords, you will notice that they tend to have quite a narrow weight range, and that's because they know their modern consumer. The modern consumer wants a sword which is nice to wave around, feels great in the hand. They're not actually killing people with it. They're not bashing armor with it. Uh, they're not trying to chop through pole arms or, or do any of the, you know, swing it from a horse. Or in most cases, they're not using it with a shield either. They're using it just by itself for some backyard cutting or just to wave around in their um, living room. So quite simply, the modern consumer has a different set of requirements from a period sword compared to an original sword. Now, as I mentioned, I was in the Royal Armouries last week. Uh, measuring and weighing um, swords. I have done this in other collections around the world as well, including the Wallace Collection, the Stibbet, and various other places. And the simple fact is that original medieval artifacts are quite diverse. And you can have two arming swords that look very similar in a photograph, but handle completely differently in the hand. So, in terms of weight, that is one thing that is much more diverse in the originals than in the good quality modern replicas. Now related to mass is point of balance or center of gravity if you prefer. That is the point at which this sword balances. Now whatever type of sword we're talking about, it could be a medieval sword, it could be a Japanese, a Chinese sword, Indian, whatever. The simple fact is that modern people have an idea of what feels nice in the hand. And there are certain books and you know, Uotoke Shop was a great unrivaled resource on the study of medieval swords, but he was guilty of the fact of describing swords as feeling good in the hand or bad in the hand based on their point of balance really, or at least their mass distribution, and that can be related to distal taper as well. Um, and the simple fact is that a tool needs to have a certain type of balance or weight distribution to achieve the goal that it's needed to do. So a cavalry sword will often balance differently to an infantry sword. A hammer will often balance differently to a screwdriver. These are different tools for different jobs, okay? So they're gonna balance differently. And there isn't really a good or bad other than good or bad for the job that that sword's required. Now, not all swords do the same job. All swords do a similar job, but they don't do the same job. As I mentioned, some are used on horseback, some are used on foot, some are used in armor, some are used in civilian dueling, uh, some are used against pole weapons, some are just used against other swords, blah, 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 loads and loads of variety. So different swords will balance differently based on their requirements. And I have to say, uh, I've handled a number of um, original medieval swords including some in the last week, that don't balance how most modern consumers would like them to balance. Does that mean that they're non-commercial for the modern world? Well, I hope not, uh, because of course, from my perspective, I'm teaching historical fencing, studying historical sources, studying the historical arms and armor. I want something that is a replica, a true representation of the original object. If it has a point of balance that is seven inches, 13 inches from the hand, um, or centimeters rather, th seven or 13 centimeters from the hand, then that's where I want the point of balance to be. But modern consumer and sales 
uh, considerations don't always work like that. If you are trying to make a sword that you want to sell really well because word goes around that feels fantastic in the hand, then obviously you're going to put a point of balance where you think the modern consumer is going to want it, where it's easy for them to wield. It might not be so effective at the job it was originally intended for, uh, but there we go. So you can see a divergence between the original requirements and the modern consumer requirements. Just to give an example, incidentally, um, the swords from the uh, post or so should we say Norman era and the kind of Crusades era often are really quite choppy in the hand and quite weighty and they do not generally handle how a modern person will want a sword to handle. Why do they handle like that? Well think of the context. They're used, at least the knightly sword is used predominantly on horseback. It's used almost entirely with a large shield, a kite shield and then a heater shield. Uh, it's used for hitting all sorts of things including mail armour, great helms and forms of nasal helmet. So it has to contend with armour, it has to chop horses, it has to be used from a horse, it has to have a long reach. So you want cleaving power and you want reach. So it won't handle fantastically if what you're really looking for is a rapier. <laughs> um, so you have to compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges. And I think sometimes these types of swords get neglected in the modern world of replication because they don't handle how a person wants them to. There is an exception when we get to Viking era swords. I don't think Viking era swords, and I'll talk about hilt design in a minute, I don't think Viking era swords handle at all how most modern consumers want them to handle. And so people actually, when they make replica Viking swords, make all sorts of concessions to their design, which make them, which I'll talk about in a minute, which make them very unlike period Viking era swords. But the Vikings are so hugely popular, thanks to TV shows and just general cultural uh, things that have been handed down to us, that people want a Viking era sword. So what people do, modern sword replicators, is they make a sword that looks vaguely like a Viking era sword, if you're lucky, but it doesn't handle like a Viking era sword, it doesn't have a, a, a grip like a Viking era sword, and so on and so forth. And, believe it or not, this also goes for long swords, okay? Long swords, hugely popular swords, the most popular weapon in HEMA fencing, for example. And if we look at the good quality production long swords on offer, huge numbers of them are quite bland in their statistics. They are quite samey. They occupy a middle ground um, of what is popular to the modern consumer. When you actually look at the originals, they often have quite different statistics, and we'll talk about a few of those in a second. So I've alluded to, to it already, but one of the biggest things which modern sword makers change uh, for, the, for the modern consumer and change from what should we say is the historical average or at least a representation of the historical cross-section or spectrum is grip length, okay? Now, funnily enough, we find this phenomenon in the two quite different, very different uh, swords. And equally, you do find it in Japanese and Chinese sword replicas as well, actually. Um, I'm not gonna give specific examples for those, but absolutely you find it outside of European swords. So here we've got a long sword, and here we've got a Viking era sword. Now, replicators, as I've implied, replicators of Viking era swords, in order to make them more palatable for the modern consumer, tend to make the grips longer. Now, this particular replica, which is an Albion, um, is actually within the historical parameters, okay? But it is at the upper end of the historical parameters, so I think it's about nine centimeters or so. Um, so this is actually um, fairly palatable for most modern people, but there are plenty of people who would complain that this grip is too short because the way they want to hold this sword and use this sword, they will find this sword very uncomfortable to use in that way. And so a lot of reenactors, for example, have overly long grips on their Viking era swords. Now this is for a secondary reason as well, to do with hand protection. So if they're wearing big uh, kind of gauntlet type gloves to protect their hands, then you can understand some argument for uh, making the grip longer. But what I would argue is actually if you design your gloves right, you don't need to make the grip longer. I think that's a weak uh, decision to make. Um, I think you should have a historically accurate sword. And if you're wearing historically inaccurate gloves, then the gloves should take up the slack in the historical inaccuracy. And you should make the gloves compromised uh, design so that they can sit around the short Viking era grip. So 
We know, and I've spoken about many times on the channel, that people compromise when it comes to Viking grip length, Viking era grip length, but they also do it in long swords as well. So it must be said that if you look at uh, uh, historical long swords, 14th, 15th, 16th century long swords, a lot of them have shorter grips than modern people want. Um, and uh, I can think of, I'm not going to, as I said, I'm not going to name specific companies, but I can think of a specific company that has released an update to a relatively popular model of one of their long swords because everyone loved that long sword, but everyone said, ah, but the grip's a bit too short. No, it's not. The grip's actually perfect length and it is that length because it was modeled on original examples of the 14th century, late 14th century. So uh, bringing out a version with a longer grip is really a concession to the modern consumer. Not to say that there weren't original long swords with long grips, of course there were, okay? But what we're talking about here is fairly and accurately representing the spectrum, the cross-section of original swords available from the historical record. Yes, some have long grips, lots have short grips. And the fact is that in the modern world, pretty much every, uh, every I won't say everyone, but the vast majority of people in the modern world, the modern consumer, wants a longer grip. Why? Because a longer grip's easier to handle when it's a long sword. Um, and especially if you're wearing any kind of gloves or you know gauntlets or um, sparring gloves or anything like this, a longer grip is easier to fit your hands onto the weapon. But the simple fact is, what are we trying to do? Are we creating modern weapons for modern people? Well, the answer is obviously yes. But if we're wanting to recreate historical replicas of historical swords and understand how they were used, then we need to replicate the ones with shorter grips as well. Why did so many long swords in, whether it's uh, 14th, 15th or 16th century swords, why did so many of them have what's compared to the modern average have quite short grips? We need to understand that, we need to unpack that. And the only way we can understand that is working with those replicas. So, grip length is hugely compromised by the average of modern replicators of swords because they are pandering and catering to the modern consumer market, okay? And it, I would love to see uh, a greater use of original statistics or at least a, a fair representation of the cross-section of original statistics so that we can actually understand the historical weapons better. Now, another area where modern sword makers cater more to the modern audience and what the modern audience wants than necessarily looking at the statistical uh, spread of original data is in overall length. So we've talked about um, we've talked about grip length or hilt length, but now let's talk about overall length and therefore by proxy also blade length. Now I've spoken about this before, but a common example of where this is the case is on katana replicas. Now katana replicas these days often have a pretty much a standard blade length of 27, 28 inches. Now the funny thing is, is that actually it goes both ways. Uh, depending which period of Japanese sword, whether it's a early Itachi or whether it's a 15th century or later katana, um, it can kind of go either, either way as to, in reality, what were the common lengths being used. Now, if we look at the uh, sort of early uh, Muromachi kind of 15th century and earlier period in Japan, we often find that there are tachi which tend to have a, they've got a different sori or curve than this type of blade. The bend tends to be uh, earlier in the blade and then straighter for the rest of the blade. They often originally, now many of them have been cut down, okay, so suriage, many of them have been cut down to be shorter blades in subsequent centuries, but many of those 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century blades were originally longer than the average of what we find today. They were 29, 30, 31 inches Nagasa or blade length, okay? Now, that's not very op often replicated by modern makers. It's not particularly popular, okay? So people actually have come to, uh, the modern consumer has come to expect a katana to have a certain degree of curvature for the most part, have a certain type of blade shape, and to have a certain blade length, which by European standard is quite short. But what's funny is once we get into the sort of later period, so we say 16th century onwards, often katanas had shorter blades than this. Uh, so certainly once we get into sort of 17th and 18th century, it's not uncommon at all for a katana to have maybe a 25, 26 inch blade. Now admittedly there are size differences, and this goes for all of the swords we're talking about here, 
uh, a modern European user is definitely likely to have an average um, taller height than a say 15th century Japanese user, unquestionably, okay? But laying that aside, if we're talking about making replicas of period weapons, I find it interesting to note that with Japanese swords, we've settled on this kind of 28 inch or thereabouts average for katanas, and it's pretty much standard for all the Chinese made modern katana replicas. Um, but in period, there were longer swords, there were shorter swords, and indeed there were swords of around this length as well. So really, I'm not complaining that 20, I'm not saying 28 inches is necessarily wrong, I'm just saying that it, the other lengths, particularly the shorter lengths of katana, are underrepresented in the modern replication world. Now, funnily enough, this is also true of medieval replica swords. Uh, if we look at the longsword, one of the most popular forms of European sword around, it is very common for modern replicas to have 36, 37, 38 inch blades on them. Historically, we actually find a lot with shorter blades than that. Yes, indeed, long swords with, or you know, bastard swords with hand and a half grips. Many times they only have 30, 32, 34 inch blades, and these are underrepresented in the replicas. Equally, some of them are much longer. Some of them are more like 39, 40, 41, 42 inch blades, and those are underrepresented as well. So again, it's about pandering or catering, whichever way you want to look at it, to the modern consumer and not really representing the spread of original artifacts. I'd also say uh, Viking era swords are not uncommonly shorter than a lot of replicas are. And indeed, if we go to arming swords, uh, then there are a lot of arming swords which are sort of 26, 27 inch blades, they're not very well represented in modern replicas because modern people like a, an arming sword to have a blade of about 32 inches, quite commonly. And equally, although they're not uh, really popular in the modern world, these earlier forms of arming sword used in the Norman and kind of Crusader era, eras, um, these often have hugely long blades that actually make them very unwieldy uh, in the hand for a person on foot without a shield. And they're not very well represented as well. So again, it's about looking at what the modern market wants and replicating that, making an analog and tweaking some of the things, the grip length, the blade length, to make it popular in the modern world, and not necessarily about representing a, an accurate uh, representation of the statistical cross-section of medieval swords. So the final point I'm going to bring up is a fairly simple one. Uh, we've talked about length and weight and balance and these kind of things, but the other one where modern makers make concessions to the modern audience is in hilt, shape, size and form. Um, quite simply because modern users like particular types of hilt because they're comfortable. Okay, And a great example of that if we go back to the old longsword, is in pommels, forms of scent stopper pommel and things like this that are comfortable for the modern user to use. In fact, historically wheel pommels maintained a huge amount of popularity right the way through uh, the medieval period, but a lot of modern users don't like wheel pommels. Uh, so people either modify the, modern, the, the wheel pommels on modern replicas, or they just avoid wheel pommels where they're able to for that historical period, uh, because a lot of modern users don't like them. Um, I have always made the argument that you should work with a replica of the thing that you're trying to replicate, of the period or the style or whatever, um, because then you get a greater understanding of that period and that weapon and its use. Equally for Viking hilts, there are certain types of Viking era hilt which are not very often replicated at all because modern people find them uncomfortable. This relates to grip length as well and the way that you grip the sword. They want to grip it in the way they want to grip it, they want to use it just for waving around or backyard cutting. They don't want to use it with a shield in the ways that it might have been used in period. So therefore, what they're really doing is they're trying to bend, bend the period design or skew the t statistics at least and skew what is represented as average in order to suit the modern usage. Um, equally, it can, it can be true of wheel pommels as well. There are actually many, I think not a lot of people realise, there are many different forms of wheel pommel and they actually vary hugely. Some are very, very flat, some are very, very thick like this. The actual cross-sectional shape of the wheel pommel can vary a lot. It can be tapered and can get thinner towards either the butt end or towards the grip end. 
Um, so huge amount of variation and even the, the very shape of these edges and the lips and stuff and how they interact with your hand. Now some of these wheel pommels undoubtedly were part of the grip in the sense that they interacted with your hand whereas some wheel pommels it seems maybe they didn't they were just there as a you know as a blob uh, as a counterbalance you might want to see them as or some people argue with that. Um, so sometimes they were intended to interact with the hand in specific ways, sometimes in different ways, and sometimes not at all, maybe. Um, and equally, if we go to something even more specific, like the Brazil nut pommel, for example, uh, there are certain styles of these which are much more comfortable than others, and obviously the modern makers tend to go for those. So, to conclude, uh, really the point I want you to go away with here is that I don't think that modern makers are aiming to deceive. I think that when they're making, uh, unless they're making something that's a specific replica of a specific surviving example, and if that's true to it, then great, okay? But if they're making, as most makers do in the modern world, make something that's an analog or an average of a bunch of different swords to give an impression of that sword, there is an inevitable bias, okay? There's an inevitable bias in their design decisions based on what the modern consumer will like. And we all know that modern consumer uh, habits are, uh, they, they can spread like a, like a virus, but in a good way. Uh, and if a sword isn't found out to be a good cutter, and I'm sure I won't name, as, as I've said for this video, I won't name specific makers, but I'm sure we can all think of examples of specific models and makes of sword that have gained a reputation as fearsome competition cutters. And so all of the people who are entering cutting competitions buy those swords because they're easy to use for the modern user. But funnily enough, even within those, there have been tweaks made to their design as concessions to the modern market, which are different to the originals in museums and private collections. So oftentimes what we're really ending up with is if not a purely modern object, because it is still, you know, it is still a replica of a historical artifact and you can find originals that are exactly like that one. But what we find is if we look at a hundred modern replicas and look at a hundred period originals, you will find that the statistical spread between the modern ones and the originals is different. The originals you will find there were more heavy ones and there are more very light ones. There are more with a very thick cross section that makes them less good for cutting but more effective for thrusting for example. You'll find in the originals there are more with very short grips. You'll find in the originals there are more examples with particularly long cross guards or strangely shaped pommels that aren't very comfortable for uh, most modern people using them in modern contexts. So quite simply the original cross section of of period swords, and I, I'm obviously using medieval swords mostly here, but it could apply to Japanese swords, Chinese swords, or anything else, Indian swords. The original cross section is far more diverse, and to me, far more interesting. And when I look at replica swords, I'm interested in that diversity. I want to look at that sword that's unusually heavy, or unusually balanced close to the hand or far from the hand, and I want to find out why. Why was that? Because that's giving you information about history and about martial arts usage. These swords over here, the modern ones made that are just an average for the modern average consumer, they tell us far less. They tell us a lot about the modern consumer, but they don't tell us so much about the diversity of period martial arts and warfare and, and history. Um, so there we go. I hope that's something for you to take away. As always, I'm fascinated to read your comments underneath this video. I hope it's been thought provoking. That's what I'm aiming for here. And also I'm not aiming to have a go at any specific manufacturers because you know I'm involved with product development myself and sometimes I understand you want to make a complete replica of a specific object and sometimes you want to make something you know is going to sell well because that will enable you to continue the business and make more swords. So clearly, you know, I'm an, I'm an antique dealer, so clearly I buy what I know will sell well, so it's the same thing. So I completely understand, but as a consumer and user of medieval swords or any other period, you know, Japanese swords, Chinese swords, I would love to see more diversity so that I can examine these nice little nuggets of information you can get from using true replicas of period originals. Thanks a lot for watching. Um, if you're not subscribed, please do so. And uh, I'll see you back on the channel really soon for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.